As Minecraft has taught us, pigs and electricity do not mix well. However, in Bad Piggies, our hero Ross, yeah, that's his canonical name apparently, kinda needs power in order to properly utilize the insane contraptions that he builds, power that is supplied by these items, the electric, V8, and gearbox engines. Adding them to a machine will drastically increase the output of all compatible parts, allowing for planes and cars and helicopters, oh my, to break the sound barrier and usually themselves right after. But unfortunately for our titular green glutton, King Pig has decided to keep all the engines for himself. Because, I don't know, he thinks they're snacks or something. Are you seriously questioning this guy's logic? As a result, we must ask the question. Is it possible to beat Bad Piggies without electricity? Nope. No, unfortunately, this challenge dies a quick and painful death in Groundhog Day Level 21, the very first time such an item is introduced. I'm forced to use the motor to power the fan, and there's just no way around it. So while I'm sure there are some levels which have cool solutions when going for minimum electricity usage, I think a much more interesting challenge comes in the form of sandbox stages. Bad Piggies features 14 sandboxes, two corresponding to each of the five main worlds, and four extra special ones. All of these have 20 star boxes to collect, with the exceptions of our two big daddies, Little Pig Adventure and Field of Dreams. These are the most massive levels in the entire game, with 40 star boxes each, but they do give me way more flexibility than any of the normal levels, with tons of interesting items that I can use freely to build whatever machines I want. So is it possible to complete both of these levels without ever harnessing the power of electricity? Before I get properly started though, it's important to clarify those pesky rules. In addition to not being able to use any engine parts, power-ups are also completely off limits. Magnets and turbocharges especially undermine this challenge, allowing me to attract star boxes and increase vehicle power respectively, but I'll also have to make do without the sticky sturdiness supplied by super glue. However, anything powered by electricity is still fair game and has the potential to be somewhat useful. Ross can make his machines move a bit without any assistance, and a little control is better than none. Although I didn't know pigs could provide electric power to machines, I'd better Google this real quick. Well, uh, the bird certainly thinks so, and who am I to argue? However, it wouldn't be very suspicious for you to dislike and unsubscribe if you abhor this pork-filled video. On the other hand, if you devour it like delicious green ham and eggs, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to see my future projects. With the goals and rules clearly defined, it's time for Ross to get started by jumping straight into Field of Dreams, where if I build it, he will come to the Starboxes, eventually if I built it right. I began to regain my epic bad piggy skills with some creative sacrificial balloon floating machines. I may have smashed into the wall over and over and over, but in my defense, it was very productive wall smashing. I started with rockets for horizontal propulsion, but soon switched to air bellows for their reusability. These levels are just too big to rely on single use items for the vast majority of collectibles. Normally you'd use something like powered wheels or propellers, but without any engines, those are more trouble than they're worth. This strategic wall bashing landed me my first five star crates, all against the left side of the level. With that, it was time to start switching up my style. Crude balloon contraptions will only get me so far, and I wanted to get all the way to the other side of the level, so I stacked a machine with rockets and activated them one by one, which worked actually, but it only got the lower box, so I extended it into a funny shape to bonk into the upper crevice. At this point, I decided it was time to build a more robust flying machine to start collecting the crates that were strewn about the floating islands, and a bit of experimentation soon landed me on this rough and steady design. It ain't pretty and it ain't fast, but I can move in any direction at any time, and that's what I need. I managed to grab six boxes in one attempt before accidentally popping a balloon while scouting and making my construction too heavy to fly. I clearly needed a smaller, more maneuverable version, and I stuck a boxing glove on the bottom to grab hidden boxes on the left side. That, uh, kinda worked. Not really, but I did get two more stars with this one, so I can't complain too much. After shopping around in this massive toy box of parts, I found a far superior replacement for my sucker punch apparatus, the suction cup. This will shoot a plunger super far, and if a star box intersects that ray, I collect it. A niche but incredibly powerful tool. Trust me, this won't be the last time suction cups bail me out of a tricky situation. Here though, it's just a simple solution to my 16th star box. After that, I cleaned up 9 more of the easiest stars littering the level out in the open.
here's where things start to get a little complicated, although it's nothing compared to what's next in Little Pig Adventure. Still, I had to get more creative, and it would be over 10 minutes before I landed myself another sweet star of success. I was trying to reach boxes stuck in the ceiling, but the monotone gray background made it impossible for me to navigate accurately. But after a few attempts, I barely nicked the corner of the box with my large propeller, while destroying my final balloon. Not like I really had a chance of going anywhere else afterward, though. I knew I wouldn't get too far by repeatedly crashing into the ceiling, especially when my only true option for liftoff is a few too many helium-filled rubber bags. So I switched tactics and began trying to spider crawl along the top of the level using suction cups, as spiders do. I mean, like, I haven't gotten close enough to a spider to know for sure, and I don't plan to, but how else would they do it? However, just because I can stick to something doesn't mean I can traverse it without issue. After a couple of four-sided failures, I graduated to six suction cups, which always allowed me to continue the rotation, essentially rolling along the roof. That is, until my machine got stuck in a crack and exploded with enough force to launch Ross into orbit. But after a bit of tweaking and covering the machine in detachables to fit more balloons instead of just rotating at 90 degrees to a horizontal position, I found my rhythm and stashed away five more boxes hidden at the top. Unfortunately, this wacky machine whacked itself a bit too hard while descending the right side wall, failing to live up to its full potential, so I took a quick hiatus from suction shenanigans for box 32, which was tucked away in an easy nook. I returned to my same suction cup setup with a different initial mobility option to grab 33, 34, and 35. Still, it's not quite slim enough to reach all the boxes on the right side of the level, so I remedied that with the best and only way I know how, high-grade explosives. But I'm getting a little tired of building machines for pigs, so I decided to construct something of my own, a brand new Flexispot standing desk. Unlike Ross's machines, this thing does need electricity because it has some super cool abilities I haven't seen in any other desk. It can move vertically, allowing you to easily switch between sitting and standing positions depending on how you're feeling at the moment. Flexispot is so confident in the quality of its product that it's offering a 15 year long warranty. I guess that's longer than a decent chunk of my viewers have been alive. And although I haven't tried to break it, I gotta say, this thing feels pretty sturdy. So if you're in need of a new workspace with some excellent special features, there's no better time to click my link in the description and buy a Flexispot desk. Anyway, back to Field of Dreams. With only three boxes left, it's about time I dive into the crags between the floating islands, but that's pretty simple with a TNT block right above Ross to launch him down. On box 39, another TNT block blocked it for me, but sure, whatever, as long as it worked. As I clumsily bounced down into box 40, I was halfway done with the challenge. Except not really. As I'd expected, that was just a warm-up, because even though Little Pig Adventure has the same number of star boxes as Field of Dreams, it's exponentially bigger, harder, and more complicated. Plus, I started with way fewer items than last time, and nothing I unlocked carries over, which means I have to build machines with minimal resources, like a medieval peasant. I barely even have any balloons. Luckily, even though this challenge area is filled with some insanely well-protected star boxes, not all of them have military-grade defenses. Just most of them. I used a mobile explosive habitat, or meh, for short, to launch myself into the nearest star, unlocking some very useful rocket propulsion for my troubles. I used these to gracefully fly over a hazardous nearby fan for box number two, earning a not quite as useful but still decent to have, I guess, gearbox lever. Not much I can do with one of these when I can't power the parts it pertains to. After performing some <clears throat> extremely useful and important experiments with my singular dynamite block, I searched for another star that I could reasonably obtain with my limited resources, and this box floating in the middle of the nearby snaking descent caught my eye. It's not too high up, so I thought I could just roll down there and grab it on the way. First though, I needed to get there, which meant going left just slightly. My first attempt at this using rockets worked a little too well, and even a singular bottle was too much. Not having the precision control that comes from high-powered pieces is quite frustrating, but I put another bottle in the way, and that did the trick. Unfortunately, I grossly underestimated the size of the machine required here and zoomed right by the floating target, but at least this wasn't a complete waste of time because another Starbucks sat at the end of the tunnel just waiting for me to crash down into it. If I wanted that floating box, I needed a robust flying machine, but building that would be no easy task with my extremely limited resource pool. Sure, I can stick a bunch of balloons and fans on something, but it can't be too bulky to navigate the tunnel. Fans aren't that great anyway, they only let me hover instead of flying freely. Eventually, I settled on this design, with two bellows for directional movement and a propeller to assist the balloons. Unfortunately, placing the propeller here forces the balloons to be higher up, increasing their chances of popping on the ceiling. I carefully inched my way down the passage with the balloons constantly in danger of popping, but with some patience made it to the clearing and grabbed my fourth star box. Hold on, that was only the fourth one? Uh, I'm in for a long ride, or maybe a short one depending on how durable this machine actually is. 
thankfully, it soon proved its versatility when I nabbed another box nearby. Multiple minutes were spent slowly collapsing this wooden fort, and there's no way I'm going to count, but I must have blown the bellows at least a hundred times. I'm basically just spam clicking here, but I'm all about that efficiency. This little pig's adventure continued as an undefended box right out in the open became my number seven, and sliding up an icy slope netted me an eighth. Number nine tried to hide from me in a crevice, but it could never truly escape from my piercing gaze. However, this amazing run met its end when I tried to traverse this cave full of fans, but I can't really complain, I'm nearly a quarter of the way through now. Unfortunately, I would remain nearly a quarter of the way through for a while, but maybe failure is the best teacher? And maybe I'm just coping. This might have worked to get box 10 if it didn't smugly hover in place after my explosion popped its balloon. Whatever, Ross wouldn't have rolled down to collect it anyway, because this block of wood is blocking him. I thought you were supposed to be useful. Well, rockets are useful, and some shenanigans with them allowed me to collect my actual box 10, which rewarded me with an absolutely worthless V8 engine. After a few more rather depressing experiments, I decided to head right instead of up or left. All that sits between me and this next box is a flimsy bridge, so I packed an explosive in order to blast right through. Hopping over this large fan didn't quite go as planned, but my machine managed to limp just far enough to put me in range. I then turned my attention to this box, extraordinarily well defended by two powerful fans. I floated up with balloons and detonated all of my TNT as close as I could, but even that wasn't enough. I had to get a little bit closer, so I stuck a couple rockets on the underside of my contraption, and that did the trick. Box 13 sits in the loop-de-loop -loop found above, and would have been easy had I not forgotten my incredibly versatile flying machine from earlier, like a stupid person with a memory disorder. Look, not every joke has to be good, okay? Instead, I used this insanely idiotic sandbag design, and sure, it did work, eventually. The bright side of that rather painful experience is that it helped me remember my much better design, which allowed me to quickly snatch up 14 and 15. I could even fly down the narrow tunnel on the right side of the level, although my first attempt at this lost a balloon and slowed me to a depressing waddle. When I finally made it down with both floaters, 16 was right out in the open, but I quickly followed that masterful piloting with an embarrassing mistake that cost me my entire machine. Although, in my defense, it basically fell apart like wet paper. Look, it barely brushed the wall! To make up for those weaknesses, I built the slowest flying machine of all time. Air gusts are too imprecise to navigate the tunnel with a wheel, so I had to switch to fans. Even with an initial rocket boost, it took five minutes of the most careful waiting of my life to reach the underground clearing, and a bit more extremely dull flying allowed me to reach my 17th and 18th star boxes. For the next one, I reverted to my original flying machine design, but the balloons are just too tall to get through this incredibly constricted cave offshoot unscathed. Even without them, I was able to half-heartedly limp this machine down the slope for box 19. But as Ross found himself naked and defenseless in this massive cave, I knew that I'd really need to up my game if I wanted the rest of the collectibles found in here, and it would only start taking longer and longer for each subsequent success. After trying unsuccessfully to get back down there with a machine better suited to the cramped environment, I switched gears and began flying again. Using a sandbag and multiple balloons, I was able to blitz past the dangerous fan that had killed previous attempts, letting me officially reach the halfway mark and unlocking a very powerful new item, the helicopter rotor. It can create enough force to lift Ross even without any type of motor, although adding anything else to this machine will ruin that. I'm still dependent on balloons, unfortunately, but it gave me just enough juice to pilot this incredibly graceful and even more more explosive machine to the mouth of an extremely tight squeeze that I hadn't been able to fit through in my early attempts. Six boxes of trinitrotoluene and a terrifying ice slide is all it took to barely nick the corner of this floating star box. No electricity required, and the suction wheels earned there were enough to drag me up this adjacent icy slope after a rather convoluted flight release involving boxing gloves, because I don't have any detachers yet. Ross fell out as soon as the smooth surface ended, but here the box is actually close enough to the ground to grab as I slid by. But, ugh, the easy part is definitely over now. It took over half an hour of dumb, fruitless experiments before I finally made any more progress, but the real strategy here is just looking for any easy boxes I might have missed. The hope is that if I can collect enough, I'll unlock some powerful new vehicle parts that allow me to tackle the most complicated collectibles in here. 23 and 24 fell to relatively simple strategies, while 25's basic machine design was challenged by a perplexing labyrinth of unpredictable fans. A couple of strategic and accidental balloon popping in incidents were adequate to collect it. Yeah, these solutions aren't exactly flashy, but a flash requires a spark, and a spark means electricity, and I don't have that. 
so you'll just have to make do with my tiny, boring solutions. I promise they do get crazier. After another half hour of failing to fly through the twisting depths of the cave on the far right side of the level, I nailed another box with the winning combo of balloons and high grade explosives. At this point, I decided to make some edits to my tried and true flying machine design by adding some detachable wheels, then took an odyssey around the entire stage. See, there's actually more than one route to most of the boxes in the level, so while going underneath everything might not be the fastest method, it's by far the easiest and safest. Eventually, I reached a wide open space on the bottom right end of the level, where boxes 27 and 8 were freely exposed. I was even able to make my way into the elusive tunnel system for 29 and 30, coming just inches away from 31 before my bellow got caught on the floor and caused my balloon to pop. Darn it! Ugh, well, I'll be back for revenge eventually. At least I know it's possible now, with only 25% left to conquer. After coming for some cold revenge and finding the dish unprepared, I set my sights elsewhere. Dynamite was my dynamic solution to the actual Box 31, protected in a crevice on the left side of the stage and guarded by a right-blowing fan. But Ross is indestructible and I have infinite retries, so no harm, no foul. After a little detour into and then back out of the ground, I returned to the level's bottom right section, where yet more remained to be accomplished. 32 required care to not pop my balloons on the side of the chasm, but my attempt ended prematurely when I failed to make it up through the tunnel. Trust me, this is hard. It necessitates a poisonous partnership between patience and precision, and given that I'm playing a mobile game with a mouse and have already spent multiple hours of my life attempting this, I don't exactly have either in spades at the moment. Still, I returned with TNT in my back pocket to take out this bridge for the box that hit underneath, and maybe the drastically reduced flight speed that came with losing a balloon during that process is what finally allowed me to make it to the top of the tunnel and grab the elusive box 34. Now at this point, I wouldn't blame you for thinking, he's got single digit boxes left. Surely the end of this challenge must be right around the corner, and that makes me sad because I'm really enjoying this video. But don't you worry, the numbers might say I'm nearly there, but in reality, I'm only a little over halfway through. At this point, every last box presents a serious problem. The next half hour was spent trying and failing to reach one of the trickiest parts of the map. These two boxes are protected by giant winding ice loops, and it would seem that an arbitrary amount of TNT isn't enough to blast up there, especially not when it sends me straight through the wall instead, because who needs physics in their physics puzzle game? After trying many different configurations and detonation locations, I got it to work. Partially. This top box is easy mode compared to the one directly underneath, because getting that one would mean slotting perfectly between the ice slides, and that's just not viable with my current explosive strategy. I tried for a little while afterward, but it's not worth wasting any more time here. Hopefully one of the other boxes can unlock a machine part that lights the path forward. My next prerogative was to find a way to topple this wooden fortress and reach the creamy Starbucks center, but even though I could get most of the way, the sheer amount of debris would always stop me from removing the final blocks. After attempting a variety of wild tactics with explosives and sucker punching, I settled on pure boxing gloves to get the job done. My left air bellow was taken out by shrapnel, which would prevent me from detaching for greater mobility, but I stayed the course and kept chipping away until I could eventually slot into the exposed area. 36 down, 4 to go. The following hour of my life was spent in abject failure attempting to get the two closest targets, but I'll talk about what makes those so brutally difficult in just a moment. First, let's tackle my Box 37, the last one which could be considered somewhat simple or easy, although obviously I passed that point long ago. It's locked inside a crevice that's so small there's not even any point in trying to fly Ross up there. But all is not lost, because a precariously positioned plank has the potential to plunge a package and push the Starbox out into the open where I can collect it. That is, if I can dislodge it somehow. To this end, I modified my flying machine design with detachable TNT and once again made the long journey counterclockwise around the stage. I honestly expected properly parking my TNT would be more difficult, but I actually got it first try. However, I didn't anticipate the danger that another rogue explosive would present and narrowly avoided my machine being blasted to smithereens. Missing Ross by a single inch, it then plummeted into the wall and launched its wooden box container back toward the flying machine, snapping off my left side guster. As the Starbox tumbled to my right, I was momentarily worried, but the imbalance now forced the propeller to move me toward it, so that was that. Now all that remains is a trifecta of the hardest stars in the whole level, targets which had continually eluded me throughout my many attempts, so let's go over them one by one to make sure you understand exactly what makes these nearly impossible without any electric power. Of course, one of these you're already familiar with, Box 35's petulant younger cousin. It has all the same problems of climbing this giant ice slope, with the added wrinkle of extreme precision being required to slide between the gaps instead of just ending up in this large central bowl. TNT is already a super inconsistent method just to get up here, so I could not rely on that. 
Another lies in a tight squeeze of a tunnel located at the heart of the stage. I didn't have the room to bring much firepower down here, and the boxes that protect it are not keen on moving. Attempts here had always ended with my machine either breaking or getting stuck before I could deal any real damage. That is, if I even managed to make it down there in the first place. The last box might be located almost directly above my starting location, but the surrounding geometry makes it anything but simple to actually access. First, I needed to get my machine through a tight squeeze above an ice slope, and then somehow had to get Ross through the tiny gap that follows it. But simply getting through the gap isn't enough. He'll just slide right down the slope and back out again, able to lay eyes on the goal without any hope of actually achieving it. Drastic airtime is also a requirement. I'm now familiar with Little Pig Adventure's final bosses, er, boxes, but I still had to choose one to tackle first in the hopes that it would deliver a new part which could actually help me out with the others. Blocked in Cave seemed like the simplest of the bunch, so I decided to focus my efforts there. All of my previous attempts had approached the problem from the left side, as it was easier to access, had more space, and just generally seemed simpler. So far though, that hadn't gotten me anywhere, so I decided to change direction. Maybe the star would be more likely to fall right, so I turned my rockets around, made some adjustments to my machine, and gave it a shot. Everything crumbled upon impact, and I feared there was no way for Ross to actually make contact. But for the first time, the Starbucks slowly slid down onto the used rocket nearby, and... that did it. Why? Certainly not complaining. I guess the part was close enough to my bad piggy for it to still count as part of his machine, and although the metal tail wing won't serve any purpose, that left me with only two stars remaining. Without any solid ideas to enter the ice spiral, my attention turned once again to the overhead menace. Well, not entirely. I did try blasting Ross up there with TNT a bunch more times, but it never worked unless I was actually trying to glitch into the wall, in which case it did work occasionally. Honestly, I wish I could tell you I thought up some genius strategy here, but it mainly came down to flying up there with various designs and crossing my fingers for a lucky explosive launch. Staying steady on the ice also presents a serious problem, but mostly in terms of positioning the TNT. After over an hour of attempts on this singular bomb, I created this design with two detachable bellows and no method of upward propulsion, because it always seemed to get in the way. As the rocket propelled my machine into the gap, it hit a crag which detonated my dynamite, and this time was different. Ross bounced down off an extruding ice shard and left off the slope below, launching him across the gap and finally sliding back down for my penultimate star box. But that wasn't even the best part! After all this time, I once again had access to the Blessed Suction Cup, which was exactly what I needed for box number 40. With this method of infinite propulsion, I was finally ready to close out this challenge for good. Instead of blasting myself to the top of the ice loop with explosives, I created a narrow rocket chain that would allow Ross to reach his goal somewhat intact. It's still far from a reliable transportation method, and I still found myself languishing at the bottom of the ice circle many times over, with the final box so close close but well out of reach. I knew that one attempt would eventually give me what I needed, but as my construction snapped apart while bouncing on the ceiling, I thought it was over once again. That was until I grabbed the broken remains of my machine in midair, swinging underneath it and flipping around for the perfect vantage point. I climbed the slope, grabbed the roof, and once again found myself at the bottom of the bowl. But still, there was nothing in my way, and I slowly climbed up and around yet again until I got the perfect launch I'd been waiting for all this time. Ah, it always feels good to prove that the majority of the game's mechanics were a waste and never needed to be implemented in the first place. Except in all the normal levels that I ignored because they would have killed the challenge and the fact that they're just pretty fun to use in general. But I don't need them, er, not yet anyway. Let me know if I should tackle the main game or some of the other sandboxes with this format. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video, and if you like what you've seen, you should probably like, subscribe, and join my Discord server to hang out with me and the other cool folks just like yourself. What can I say? Doing more of what makes you happy is usually a good idea, and it would make me happy too. Until next time, have a good one.